We're going to look now at the other two types of uh, control action in a PID controller. Uh, first, we look at integral control and a variation of that, which is adding the proportional and the integral control together, which is called, surprisingly, proportional integral control. But first, let's look at the integral action by itself. Uh, pure integrator, uh, pure integral controller computes control effort such that U of T, the control effort going into the plant, is equal to a constant times the error signal integrated from zero, time zero up until time now. So it's a running integral of all of the error that has happened from when I turned the system on until right now. And in the Laplace domain, remember that uh, the running integral is 1 over s, so the controller transfer function is kp over tis. Uh, kp um, could be any old constant, but later on we'll think of it as, uh, when I'm doing a proportional integral controller, as still being the proportional constant. Uh, Ti is uh, the integral time constant, and it turns out to be the time for the output to uh, get as high as Kp when the input is a, a unit step function. Uh, and that's why it's called that, but basically it's a tuning parameter. It's a constant that we can choose, and um, obviously choosing Kp and Ti in this example, um, if I, you know, I can just combine those and choose a single constant, uh, which is what this formulation says. Let's just use a single constant Ki instead of Kp over Ti, and you get D of S is Ki over S. So you'll see both of those different formulations in different textbooks. The big advantage of integral feedback is that it can give control, uh, non-zero control effort, even at points in time when the error is zero instantaneously because it remembers that the error has not always been zero in the past. Uh, in many times, this can eliminate steady state error to uh, step like reference inputs and step like disturbances. Um, remember from our prior example that to avoid oscillations and sometimes even instability when using proportional control, uh, which was the previous topic, and the gain that we used had to be kept small. But when the error gets small, uh, you know, we're not multiplying by a very big gain. We have a small error and a small gain. That means that we're not really trying very hard to correct the error, and that can lead to this finite steady state error, that we just never push hard enough to correct all the error that is present. Also, uh, there can be some kinds of nonlinearities in the system that are truly there that are not in our model because we're using linear models. Uh, for example, Coulombic friction is a kind of a, a stickiness that uh, can cause the output to get stuck if the control effort, even if the control effort is not zero, simply because I'm not pushing hard enough to overcome the stickiness of the system. And those of you who are taking the uh, feedback control laboratory as well will find this to be a big concern with the magnetic levitation unit, that there is this stickiness that has to be overcome. And any controller that does not use an integral action really works very poorly. Uh, so you need to use an integrator con integral controller with it. And those of you in the grad uh, section of this course will be doing a lab-based project, so you'll also encounter that. Integral control can help. Uh, if we integrate this error signal, the integrated value will grow over time if the error is stuck. Um, think about it this way. Suppose my error was equal to 0 0.1, which seems kind of small, at least on some scale. Uh, and I compute because of that to have a certain control input to the plant, um, but my plant my my uh, plant is stuck, and so it doesn't move. And so my error is 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. It stays the same because uh, the plant hasn't moved, and I keep control computing the same control effort because the error is the same, and it just never gets better. 
But if I integrate the 0 0.1 over time instead, uh, I'm integrating some value. I'm pushing harder and harder and harder. Um, and at some point, I'm going to overcome that friction. And the error is going to go down. And so I'm going to start integrating a lesser value and a lesser value and a lesser value. And this is going to level off and then eventually go down. Uh, so the integrated error uh, accumulates even when there is a small error signal in order to try to eliminate that small signal. Another, uh, maybe another example from real life, um, I have kids, uh, some of you do too, uh, and you know, if I lend some money to my kids, if I lend a small amount of money, uh, I might not try very hard to get it back. You know, if I lend $20 to one of my children, I'm going to try pretty hard to get $20 back. And so that's like a big error in my bank account. Uh, there's a, there's a, a big number missing, and um, boy, I, I'm really going to make sure that uh, I get that back from them at some point. But if I, you know, if they say, oh, could I have a, a dollar for a pack of gum or or whatever, you know, I might not re remember that. It's not a very big error in my bank account. I might not try very hard to get that back. And um, if this repeats over and over and over again, you know, every week when we go to the grocery store, if they want a dollar to buy a, a pack of gum or something for themselves, then um, if I use proportional control, then I'm, I'm losing a dollar a week and I'm never getting it back. But if I use integral control, I'm keeping track of IOUs. So the first week, um, they owe me a dollar. Not a big deal. Not going to work hard at it. Second week, they owe me $2. Third week, $3. Fourth week, $4. Fifth week, $5. All of a sudden, I'm getting close to some threshold of tolerance, and so I'm integrating in my mind how much they owe me. So if I keep track of this, I'm going to be much more sure to get it back. I'm not sure if that analogy works, but I thought I'd try it out. Anyway, it does work in control. So uh, let's take our DC motor equations that we developed and substitute this particular kind of controller into them so that the control effort is a constant times the integral from 0 to t of the reference input minus the uh, motor output over uh, that period of time. So we're starting with the differential equations and putting into those differential equations where u was, where our input is, is right there. Um, and then I had uh, the, you know, this was tau on tau 2 s squared y of s, tau on tau 2 s times y, one, 1 times y equals a times the input plus b times w. We could have done an inverse Laplace transform to get that, so that's where we got that from. Uh, working with this equation is a bit cumbersome because it's a mix of derivatives and integrals. Uh, so we are going to differentiate both sides of this equation to make it a purely a differential equation. You have to be extremely careful when you do this because uh, you have to employ what's called Leibniz's rule, L-I-E-B-N-I-T-Z, I, -E I believe. Uh, you can look that up on the interwebs. And uh, when you're differentiating an integral, it's not always what you think it is, especially if the limits of integration involve the thing you're differentiating with respect to, and we are here. Uh, but I've done all that, and uh, you can go and do this on your own and ensure that I've done it right. So differentiating all of these terms, tau1, tau2, y double dot becomes tau1, tau2, y triple dot, uh, tau1 plus tau2, y dot. I get, it, I get another dot because of the differentiation. I get another dot because of the differentiation. And then uh, this a k p over t i is a k p over t i times differentiating the integral in the proper way turns out to give me r minus y of t. And then the bw becomes b times w dot. And the feedback has given me a y on the right-hand side, which we bring back over to the left-hand side, multiplied, of course, by its constant. So I get that here. 
this A times KP over TI with nothing else changed. Now, we can look at what is the steady state error of this feedback configuration. And again, we're in steady state. This means that uh, nothing is moving. In steady state, my output is constant, my reference input is constant, my disturbance is constant. So if, for example, R is constant, then um, I have that R steady state in this term right here. If W is constant, then its derivative is zero, and that goes away. If Y is constant, then its derivatives are zero, and those go away, and I end up with AKP over TI equals AKP over, oh, sorry, times Y equals AKP over TI times R, and those constants cancel out, and I get Y in steady state equals R in steady state. Now, if you remember, when we used proportional control, we didn't have this result. We had that in steady state using feedback um, with proportional control, I had a worse result than open loop control if there was no disturbance. Um, but now this adding this integrator has helped. In fact, even if there is a step like disturbance, as long as there is a steady state uh, W that's constant, uh, then that even gets canceled out. I'm not ignoring it. It actually goes away. So this integral feedback integrates all error, whether it came from the disturbance or if it came from not tracking properly the reference input, and it changes the input signal to the plant, U of T, in order to force that steady state error to go to zero. So that's the primary reason for adding an integrator to control systems, is to make the steady state tracking better, to make steady state disturbance, or sorry, steady state error go away. But there's a trade-off. Otherwise, we'd always just throw integrators at the problem and until everything was perfect. The trade-off is that um, while steady state tracking gets better, dynamic tracking generally gets worse. And it can even destabilize the system. So we looked at uh, what we called a root locus plot uh, in the last section of notes. And you'll have to trust me on this because we haven't developed the tools yet to be able to uh, plot these ourselves. But this on the right here is a root locus plot for the motor example when I'm using an integral controller. First, uh, the integrator has added a pole to the system. The 1 over S uh, from the integrator gives me a, a pole at the origin when uh, the, the integrator gain Ki is equal to 0. So that itself is uh, not, not stable, so we don't use a Ki equals zero. Uh, but at Ki equals zero, the other poles of the motor are still exactly where they started at minus one over tau one and minus one over tau two. As I increase the feedback gain, though, this Ki, what happens is that the pole on the left uh, goes farther and farther and farther left uh, forever. So the bigger I make Ki, the farther that pole goes to the left. Uh, this pole at the origin also moves to the left, and this pole moves to the right. And uh, so if I choose a small value of Ki, all of the poles are in the left half plane, and all of them are on the real axis. And I have a system with zero steady state error, but because of this pole right there being quite close to the origin, I'm going to have fairly slow dynamic response from the system. My settling time is going to be slow. My rise time is going to be slow. Um, furthermore, if I turn up the gain even farther, you know, this pole here is going to go up down that branch, and that pole is going to go up that branch. And uh, these poles are getting closer and closer to the imaginary axis. If you think about a pole there and a pole there, this damping ratio due to that angle, that zeta is really small. So I'm going to have a really underdamped system, a very oscillatory system. And if I'm not 
really being at all careful, then uh, this pole here eventually goes into the right half plane, and so does that one. And I end up with two unstable poles. Uh, this third one is stable, but it doesn't matter. Um, I end up with a system that is unstable, and uh, we don't want that at all. So um, I have improved steady state error, but at the with the consequence that I have degraded the transient response of the system. So this is one reason why we might introduce uh, integral control along with proportional control. And so instead of using integral control by itself, I have this. I have the control effort as kp times the error signal plus kp over ti times the integrated error signal. And taking Laplace transforms, my controller transfer function is going to be kp times 1 plus 1 over ti times s. In this case, we can go through and find the closed loop denominator. And if we do, the poles are going to be the roots of this particular equation here. And this equation gives me, instead of only one knob to turn, it gives me two. In fact, this kp and the ti now do have an independent uh, way of working on the, on the system that kp is the only term that, that changes the factor multiplying s, but both of them change this constants, this units term. So there's two degrees of freedom. In the root locus plus, we're looking at only one degree. As I, as I turn one knob or slide one slider, what does that do to the pole locations? Well, I can completely have a whole um, family of root locus curves uh, where in the root locus curve I, I might change kp, but the family then is indexed by ti, and I have much more freedom in what, what I design. Not going to say much more about that at this point. Uh, we'll be able to see and talk about that much more intelligently when we learn to talk, uh, to draw the root locus and more about what they mean. So the idea of integral control is I'm, I keep on adding up error until uh, my control effort is big enough that something happens, something changes. Uh, derivative control is kind of the opposite. Uh, pure derivative controllers compute control effort u of p equals a constant kp td, uh, both of those being constants, times the time derivative of the error signal, or the compensator is kp times td, again both constants, times s, and td stands for a derivative time. There's an alternate formulation that combines those two constants together and just calls it kd. Uh, again, both of these are seen in different textbooks. Now, the idea of derivative control is that we'd like to anticipate, in some sense, what's going to happen in the future to reduce oscillation. If I, if I know that I'm about to overshoot, then I should be able to do something about it, um, versus if I don't know I'm going to overshoot, I don't do anything about it. Um, Overshoot, at least in mechanical systems, is generally because of momentum. I've pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed to try to get my my object closer to the goal, and I forget the fact that when I get to the goal, the object is still going to have momentum. It's going to keep on going even if I'm not pushing it. And this is the this is why there's overshoot. And so it goes way beyond the goal, and as soon as it goes beyond the goal, I realize, oh, no, I'm in trouble, and I start pulling back. I've got negative error, so I start pulling on it, but it takes a while for the momentum to turn around and come the other way. Uh, momentum, mechanically, is mass times velocity, which is equal mass times the derivative of position. So if I could... Um, apply a force to my object that was proportional to velocity uh, in a negative sense, so I'm, I'm 
you know, I, I want to put a forward force on the, the system that's proportional to error, but I also want to put a negative force on the system that's proportional to velocity to recognize that there is going to be this overshoot and that I want to subtract some momentum out in order to try to eliminate this overshoot. That's the idea. If you want to think about it in terms of slopes and so forth, if I'm going you know, this way with my error, um, that means that I, hmm, I'm, I'm really doing badly, so I, I might want to put some extra control effort on it. But if I'm going flat, um, in fact, it does nothing uh, to eliminate steady state errors. If I have a constant steady state error, notice that E dot will be zero and U will be zero. So a derivative controller um, actually makes steady state error worse in many cases. And if there is steady state error, it doesn't do anything to try to fix it. Uh, pure derivative control is theoretically um, something that looks attractive, but in practice, uh, you can't do it. Uh, it just doesn't work. So the reason is sensor noise. So suppose I have a signal uh, which nominally is something like this, and the derivative control of that, well, it's flat. So my derivative would be zero, and my control effort would be zero. And that might be exactly what I want because I've settled to my steady state, and everything is beautiful, and I love it, and I don't want to have any control effort. But what if my sensor has a little bit of noise on it? It doesn't have to be big, just a little bit of noise on my sensor. Um, if you blow up that noise, it's going to look something like this. And remember, the derivative is equal to the rise over the run of some slow, of some part of the curve. So if I look at some part of it, um, the run is small and the rise is uh, proportionally large. So even if the value of the error is tiny, the derivative of the error when there's sensor noise might be very large. And therefore, KD times the uh, derivative of this sensor noise uh, could just get way out of hand. So we can't do pure derivative control, even if I think I've got a really clean sensor, simply because any noise at all is going to make it bad. So there's a practical version of uh, the derivative controller. It's called a lead controller, and we'll study that later, including why it's called that. In fact, you know, the integrator uh, that we looked at improves steady state error and um, might de make destabilize the system. There's a, a practical version of it called a lag controller, which is um, similar in some ways to the lead controller. We'll study that later, too. Um, because of this anticipatory nature, the, the derivative controller anticipates future error, it tends to cause the system to be more stable than without it. But as we said, if there's a constant error, it does nothing at all to reduce or eliminate that constant error. If E dot equals zero, then U equals zero, even if E is equal to a billion. As, lo as long as my error is not changing, the derivative controller doesn't try to get rid of it. If we go through the motor control example and we put the derivative in, um, we get this to be our closed loop uh, denominator. And if we think about this in, the, in terms of our, uh, our standard form, the term in front of S is the 2 zeta omega n S. And so this TD is entering the zeta term. And this is how we're controlling the damping. We're making the damping better in this system. Again, we can combine derivative control with proportional control. So if we might want added stability at the same time as reasonable steady state error, we would uh, combine the two of those. And I would have then the D of S is KP times 1 plus T D of S. And um, we could write it like that. And using proportional derivative control, 
um, notice that the compensator adds a zero to the system. This is a numerator root, and this is the first time we've seen a root locus plot with a zero on it, but this is the zero that is added to our system by the proportional derivative controller. So what happens in a in our motor example, if I have zero feedback gain, my poles are right at the open loop poles like before, minus one over tau two and minus one over tau one. But as I turn up the feedback gain, uh, the pole here moves this way and the pole here moves that way. So both of them are moving farther away from the origin, which means that my rise time is better, my settling time is better, and I'm on the real axis, so my overshoot is still zero. I have a zeta of one. And in fact, I can turn up the gain of the system KP, I can turn it all the way up to infinity, and this pole here, when gain gets to infinity, actually hits that zero, cancels it out, and this pole is way out here at basically minus infinity. And what I ha have as the gain of the system reaches infinity is that this step response is actually equal to a step. I have um, beautifully fast and in the intermediate smooth control of this. So there's great damping, although as it turns out, um, the derivative control doesn't help the steady state error. The proportional control may help, but it may not help much. So there still might be poor steady state error, which is why I might at some point want to add an integral back in to the system to improve that. So that is a, a preview of why we might want to have a proportional term or an integral term or a derivative term in a controller. In the next section, we're going to look at uh, an example of putting all three of these together and uh, some simple ideas of how you might do a design of the PID controller. Um, and so let's get to it.